Now, once we have looked at the basic elasticity problems, the equations of equilibrium, and then when we move to chapter 2, where we looked at planar stress problems with stress strain boundary conditions and Aries function, now it is, I think, a time to move to two different and two important topics in this chapter 2, which is one is torsion and second is bending. Now, why are these two problems classically very important? If you look at an aircraft, right? So, even though you assume an elliptical wing section, something like this nature, right? So, the wing is of this nature. There is this fuselage, there is this tails, there is this vertical tail projection, there is this fuselage which is coming like this. Right, and there are these engines. The classical formulation of elliptical wing also will tell you that there is lift force which is coming out of this plane, distributed uniformly. Right? Then there is this twist and the thrust force. Right? Because fuselage is integrated finely with your wing here. Right? If you take a sectional view, you will see this cord where the lift is happening and then there are these all sh resultant shear movements, distributions. What it is going to cause is a rotational movements around this right? and then these shear forces, the pairs of them, right? which are trying to twist this aircraft angles in this direction. They are going to twist aircraft angles in this direction right? and then there is this twist movement which is going to bend the aircraft like this or twist it like this. So let us start imagining that if this is my wing, right? the aircraft wing as a structure is going to be extremely critical part of everything because the entire lift depends on it, the engines are carried on it. right? So the first task for a structure's guy is to look at the aircraft wing motions and the corresponding equations. So this aircraft wing is going to get bent under the forces of lift and weight. Weight will bend it like this, lift like this. So these two interplays will ensure some bending. Right? Given this is also not uniform, right? there is going to be a shear tendency in nature like this. So there may be a slight bending like this, in this direction, you see, a warping. And then because of these twist motions, there is going to be a twist, the torsional motion. So wing as a whole plate section is going to get twisted like this. So this motion, this motion and these motions. These are all bending and torsional problem. Right? Fuselage. This is my fuselage. Right? A fuselage is going to get subjected to some twisting motions, subjected to some bending motions. I cannot bend it so much, but bending motions like this plane and bending motions like this plane. All of these are extremely important to analyze because based on how these bending twist torsion equations work, my aircraft stability gets affected, material of construction changes, and acceptable limits of twist and torsion dictates certain load factors, n, n times g, that's how we call it, right, ng, load factors. So, structures person is finally concerned about given material of construction choice, given the wing area that aerodynamics tells him, given these drag first profile. So aerodynamist will, so the profile sequences like this. First, flight mechanics guy gives flight envelope design. This is design. That you have to do certain maneuvers where different NG load factors and different lift thrust drag requirements are to be satisfied. Blah blah, the different control surfaces are here and so on. Aerodynamist guy gives wing structure, wing and tail effectively structure. So he will tell well, this is how my aerofoil is going to look like, the distribution of it. This is my wing surface, wing sweep, wing area, tail area, fuselage, roughly right, from aerodynamics point. Propulsion guy gives thrust and drag relations. Right? So where my engine says, therefore what is the thrust, what is the drag, what are the movements, what is the weighted area, what is this weight of this, where the loading is going to happen. 
and then once these three are given design by structures that gives MOC load and flight feasibility which means based on this constraint he defines okay for this shape I will have to add some reinforcement ribs here or some sparse right? he, he may say okay in your structure the skin thickness has to be so much so your aerofoil will actually now look like this because I need so much skin thickness right? the wing is never a surface like this right if this is the inside body it is always something like this right? where this is skin thickness and then there are these reinforcement ribs, sparse, limit, buckle, bucklers, and multiple enforcers. Right? All of these are what in control of structures people to finally dictate this flight envelope feasibility. Right? That yes, if you load it with so much lift at such a velocity, the lift for him is a force. So he would say my wing twisting the bendings and bucklings are so that it is acceptable or not and therefore my MOC is this therefore the weight of the structure the empty weight of aircraft is so much now you take and react it so this is a four step iterative process everything feeds in right? and to have this perspective in mind is extremely important before starting this equation analysis because most of the time you get lost in the equations without looking at a broader picture you have looked at in a broader sense why stress strain are important in a body, why these resisting movements are important, right? You have also looked two dimensional problems and their importance in aircraft structures because why some of these can be simplified as two dimensional structures, why these all complicated Aries functions are come out. Next step in this now is to understand therefore this big picture of aircraft design and aircraft operations as to why the structures have to understand torsion and bending. It is because of this four step process of flight envelopes giving loading factors, aerodynamics giving lift distributions and tail structures, the distributions of the load at different end maneuvers, propulsion guys giving different thrust loadings and the weight and the engines and then this all finally coming to us as a structures people to therefore design a right correct material of construction, designing correct internal structural features like skin thickness, span, spar, rib, right? And then finally giving that this is feasible, this is not feasible, this is the final shape of the structure, weight of the structure, and this is the load factors that you can accept. It's a recursive process. See how four complex departments come in. And then the final, of course, control guys will come in and say, I need so much controls, so many hydraulic lines to fly, fly through, so many electromechanical controls, I need this intentionally made static gears and so on, and so hundred other things. They have not got into complexity of landing gears here. That is a separate load analysis. So this is the iterative process. But in this most of most important is this wing surfaces. And wing as I call is not just this main lifting wing. Even the tail and vertical tail are like a wing surface. Most important are those surfaces because they determine 90% of your design iteration. Fuselage is not a big headache. Other internal control surfaces are not that complicated feature so we are not too much worried about them but the biggest worry for any of us is to actually look at what happens to these wing loadings and wing structures right so with this enough broad context now let us look at in detail what the torsion and bending would mean we are going to now focus on purely the torsion here wherein the torsional analysis from fundamentals we will look at what happens right what is the twist and aircraft, as I said, is because of this lift movement, is going to experience significant torsion. So if this is my wing surface, right? The line of action of lift, as aerodynamists will tell me, is this. All these are lift forces, right? If you take roughly the center CG plane or this plane, you would see each of these are going to generate movements. Right? So effectively, this wing structure if I look at this line as this movement, the torsional movement, which is going to come at the root because this is fixed surface right? and this is free, which means torsion as a whole is going to dictate my aircraft wing twist, warping and the stresses corresponding to it. 
So therefore now it is time to look at some basic physics phenomena before going into the mathematics. Imagine this is a section to resist the torsion. Now we will start calling structures to resist something, which means we define some materials or structures to resist some load, right? That's the base, basic requirement. If this is my main structure, now this structure assume it's some, some arbitrary cross-section uniform throughout in this plane. If I apply load, see what is happening. Yeah? If I apply a twisting movement, I cannot apply in both this direction. Otherwise, it is not twist. It is rotation. Right? So the torque at these sections are applied in such a way that the relative displacement is zero. And this is extremely critical. Aircraft, because it is stable, you do not have these movements which actually turn the aircraft like this or turn the aircraft like this. No. What you are concerned is this balanced torques. So, which means if you consider an arbitrary cross section, the same cross section that torque is applied is this one in this direction and one in this direction, so that this entire body as a whole does not revolve. You are not applying on this a torque so that this body starts rotating with RPM. No, your structures are anyway not designed to be meant for that, right? You have designed your structure so that these torques can actually be sustained. So if this is the case, we will start defining some coordinate plane. So this is Z plane, this is XY plane, right? So let's call this X and this as Y. So in Z plane, if this is my structure, which is typically going to be aircraft wing type or any structure, then I am going to have these two torques applied and I am interested in this torsion problem what would happen to the structure again going back to this planar theory that we looked at and the step process one look at stress relations second boundary condition for stress and body force third string fourth displacement this is how the cycle behaves and we will exactly follow this cycle now to analyze in depth what would happen. Now first let's empirically therefore look at this. Look at the stress relations. Now this body which we have to look at has this torque applied, right? We have to make one assumption that this is free without any restraint to interact in this twist problem. Hmm? What is the implication? Is this. If this is my body which is not made free from rest any restraint and say assume this is glued right this is solid glued what would happen if you see is there is each section twisting in itself which means if I restrain it then this sectional twist is gone so then let's call this section 1 section 2 and section 3 section 1 is going to twist with respect to section 2 and with respect to section 3 in xy plane as well otherwise if I take slices of this slice 1 slice 2 slice 3 and I make this without any restraint free see what is happening this is coming out right which means this is called a warping warp right denoted as w the displacement in this direction. So this section is rotating and coming out. Right? The rotation is happening. But it is free. So section 1's rotation is free from section 2's and free from section 3. So the only displacement allowed is in z direction and not relative displacement as we looked. So sections will still remain like this as viewed from the side. But as viewed from the front, you would have one section like this, one section twisted like this, one section twisted like this. Right? I'm just exaggerating. So this section is going to come out in this plane. And that is the warping. Now, second, have we applied any load? No, it is only torsion. Right? Which means, in the case of torsion, you cannot have axial stresses getting produced. Sigma Z is zero. Otherwise, if that is non-zero, this would produce an axial force here which we have not applied, so sigma z is 0. If there is 
tensile stress sigma y or sigma x, what would happen? Is if you integrate the force, there would be a net force in this direction. Which means, in the case of pure torsion, by this torque coupled, tau, right? There is no chance to produce these tensile stresses. Hmm? Extremely important argument. Extremely important. Right? Second, we have said, we have allowed the warping, which means there is a free relative motion of each slices of this section with respect to each other. And if there is a free motion, by definition, what is your tau xy? Tau xy is this, which twists the section itself, right, in this xy plane. So this section, since it is free to rotate with respect to another disc adjacent to it, tau xy also has to be zero. These are extremely important fundamental assumptions that we have to look at. And now, these are not a very severe or stringent assumptions per se, right? Because what we are doing is essentially we are ensuring that there is this warping which is happening. So each section coming out on its own twist, right? Theta. Each section rotating with respect to theta. So we will call it section rotation by angle theta. Interesting point to note is theta is only function of z. See this physics argument. Had it been function of x and y, the section on its own would also get destroyed and not preserve as that disk, right? Because if theta is also function of z, different particles at different locations would rotate with different angle. So say if this is the original cross-sectional shape and this moves by 20 degrees, right? And this moves by 60 degrees, your circle will get destroyed. Which is not happening because you have rest not restrained, it is free warping. So this circle disk as a whole rotates only with constant angle. Next circle disk may rotate with different angle. Next with different, different, different. So theta has to be only function of z. So we'll park it here, this argument, why we have done. This is clear. Why there are no tensile stresses and why not in plane shear stress. Once this is clear, which means the only resisting elements to this torque are tau zx or tau xz and tau yz right and that is clear because because of this relative motion there has to be this slippage because tau yz z, this directional torque is going to be resisted with this twisting elements right so these are the two elements now we go back to our equilibrium equations if we assume if x y z are zero which is known there are no body forces here it is only a torque couple then our equation of del sigma x y del x plus del tau x y by del y plus del tau x z by del z, right? This equal to zero is the first equation of the, this was the equation of equilibrium in x direction. This is zero. Sigma x and tau x y are zero. So what you get is this equation, right? So, this one equation is clear. Similarly, this is true from second equation and third equation where del sigma z by del z was there and these two as del tau xz by del x plus del tau yz by del y. These two are zero, so this is third equation. So the three equilibrium equations for the body give me these three equations for the two stress that I have to determine. Which means, see the interesting point, these stresses are independent of z, they are uniform throughout and that has to be, if there is a build up or build down there is going to be relative twist which means that is not the right case. So therefore these two stresses are independent of z. They only behave with this coordinate but in such a fashion that it is very intuitive. Here Prandtl introduced a concept called Prandtl's stress function. He used same symbol phi like the array but what he said is let's substitute 
tau zy as minus del phi by del x here tau yz because you need something like this then so that it is del x del y both sides you, that is your main objective 